Hey there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Today I want to look at how you can turn any single board computer like a Raspberry Pi Zero into network attached storage. So if you want to find out more, please well, let me explain. So this is really a follow-up video to a video I did a few months ago about setting up uh, RAID drives on a Raspberry Pi. People were asking for a more kind of step-by-step -step, hands-on approach. So that's what is in this video. Now, two quick things. First of all, I make some assumptions about what state you're already in. I assume you know how to install Raspberry Pi OS or whatever OS it is you're using on your board. I assume that you know how to set up a static IP address and I assume you know how to enable secure shell. That way I can start from that point rather than going through the stuff about how to install. There's just so many tutorials and how many videos on just installing Raspberry Pi OS. You don't need me to repeat that now. And the other thing I want to talk about is that because we're going to be dealing with boards like the Raspberry Pi Zero, we need to understand there are three things that affect performance. The first is the network connection that you're going to use. Obviously, you're transferring data to and from this network attached storage. I'm going to be using the Wi-Fi built into this. That's the lowest form of uh, communication here. Of course, we could use USB Ethernet. So that could be a bottleneck. The other thing is that the CPU on the board can be a bottleneck. If it's not powerful enough to cope with all that data coming in and out, it will slow down. And finally, of course, the type of USB connection, USB 2, USB 3, how fast those are, the high end of hard drive you use, how that's connected to the USB will, of course, also potentially be a bottleneck. So as we'll see when we've got the Raspberry Pi Zero up and running, there are going to be bottlenecks and it may not be the fastest. When you look at other boards, we're also going to look at the Raspberry Pi 3, different bottlenecks because of different ways of doing things. But the key thing I want to get over is it doesn't matter whether it's the smallest, cheapest board you've got or a hundred and hundred dollars board that you've got, you can actually convert it into a working network attached storage. So assuming you have a Pi up and running, it's got an IP address and it's got secure shell enabled, let's go and have a look on how you do it. One thing we need to do is change the name of our device. They all default to Raspberry Pi, which of course we don't want, especially if you've got other Raspberry Pis on your network. So we run the Raspberry config program. And then inside of there, we get down to number two, network options, and then host name number one. And then we'll change this to whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call mine my Pi Zero NAS. So my Pi Zero network attached storage. And then we go through, and would you like to reboot now? Yes. And when that comes up, it will have the new name on it. Okay, so now I've plugged in the external hard drive. The particular one I've plugged in is a Seagate with an external power supply. I've plugged it into the hub. And now we need to find that hard disk. Now there are lots of different ways of doing this. I like to look at the last entries in the message log. And as we can see here, it's saying, well, SDA1, uh, has now appeared, has been added in to the system. Another way we can do it is we can go into slash dev slash disks and then list by ID and that will show us all the disks there and there we can see this this ATA, uh, ST and so on and so on which I know actually is that drive. If we do an LS minus LA we can actually see those are linked to SDA. Uh, an SDA1, and then probably the simplest way to do it is LSBLK, LS block, and that will show me here that I've got an SDA with an SDA1 uh, partition on it. Now, if your disk was actually uh, well defined and uh, formatted, you may have found that the Raspberry Pi will have automatically mounted it, so it's worth checking. So, if we do a DF minus H here, we can see. And in fact, that slash dev slash SDA1 has been mounted on slash media slash pi. So before we go any further, we need to unmount that. So you do a sudo uh, umount slash dev slash HD SDA1, and that will unmount it. And then if we do df minus h, we can see now it is not mounted. So there we go. I've got three terabyte, 2.7 terabyte uh, drive there, and it's got a uh, partition. So what we're going to do now is we're going to completely erase that. So a warning. What I'm doing now is I'm erasing all the data on that disk. 
okay and then we're going to create a new partition for us now different ways of creating partition lots of different tools i'm just going to use f disk there are two or three others that you may prefer to use slash dev slash sda because that's what we found out here and you always put the that's dev for device so it's f disk slash dev slash sda and then if we do o that will create a brand new disk label which means now there's nothing on it so if you do a p for print that is completely empty. And then I'm gonna do N for new, P for primary, the first partition, we'll take the beginning and we'll go all the way to the end. Uh, yes, we'll remove any previous signatures, which, which was a raised signature, I don't know what I was using that disk for, but that's the, po the point of this. Now we have is a brand new uh, disk uh, partition, SDA1 for uh, Linux. It's telling me that other stuff on there from the past, which was the RAID stuff, that's all gonna be wiped away. So I'm very happy with that. So what we do to do a W to write it out, and that's it, that is now partitioned. And then of course, after you partition, you actually need to make the file system. And the way you do that on Linux is using the make file system command. So we just get MK for make, FS for file system. What type of file system are we making? Are we making a DOS one? Are we making a, a Linux one? Are we making NTFS? Now we do EXT4. And then we need to give it the name, the address of the partition, the name of the partition. So it's not SDA, it's SDA1. And then that will create that partition. Of course, you can have lots of different partitions. You could choose to have two, three, four, however you want to. I'm just using a big disk with one partition on it. Okay, now that we have our disk uh, format, partitioned and formatted, we need to be able to auto mount it. So the way we're going to do that is we first of all need to go into or have a look in slash dev slash disk uh, by, and then we're going to look for the UUID. So that gives us this unique uh, ID, which means if in the future something happens where you plug in a second disk drive and then it boots up first and it gets called SDA rather than your one, this number here doesn't change. This big long number here is unique. And so when we mount the drive, we can mount it using that number. And it doesn't matter if we connect future drives, other drives that boot up in a different order, or we have that one disconnected once and then it, it will always use this one. So now, okay, now that we have this big long number here, I'm just gonna cut and paste that. So I have a copy of it for uh, in a moment. The next thing we should do is create a place where we're gonna mount the drives when the system boots up, where does it mount them? Some people like to mount their drives under, you know, slash mount or slash volume or slash media and then a drive. I like to just put things at the top level. Maybe some system administrators won't like me for that, but I like to keep it nice and simple slash 3 TB, three terabyte drive. That's what I'm gonna do there. And now we go in and we edit the file system table, the FS tab, so that we can actually mount that. So edit slash FS tab. Okay, and what we do in here is each one of these lines is a drive that needs to be mounted. Okay, and these are the ones that Linux uses, Ras Raspbian's using in this case. So we're just gonna add in a, a new line UUID is equal to, and then that number that we, we copied from earlier on. So that always makes sure that is the drive that's going to, the, the partition get mounted. Where am I mounting it? You can put tabs between these or spaces. Let's go with tabs uh, three terabyte. Remember, we just created that. And we will need to tell it it's ext4. There is a format to this. You can look up the format uh, in the man page on the online documentation. It's always this same way. And you can see it's copying the way the lines are above. And then we want to give it some options. Here in these other ones, they've used these options of defaults. We want to make sure we use no fail. Okay, and that makes sure, an auto, and that makes sure that if the drive isn't responsive at boot up time, it won't stop the system from booting. And then these last two numbers are to do with the order that checking done on the file system. So we just leave it at zero, zero. Again, some system administrators might wanna change that to one, one or one, two or something like that. I'm happy with it like that. Okay, and that's it. So what we've done, we've said, I want to mount this partition, which has got that unique ID. So it doesn't matter if it doesn't appear as SDA one anymore. I wanna mount it on uh, the three terabyte directory created is an ext4. Don't fail booting if you don't, uh, if it doesn't work. And then the uh, FS check thing. So now we need to save that file. Okay, so now we have an FS tab. We can look at that, that uh, has our file, our partition listed in it. It's got a place where it's gonna mount it. And so we can either reboot at this point, we will reboot later, or what we can do now is we can say, 
uh, mount minus A, which means it will say, please go through the FS tab file and make sure everything in there is mounted. And that will now go ahead. And if we now do a DF minus H, we can see down here at the bottom that SDA one, because that's what it currently is, is mounted on our directory three terabytes. Okay, so now let's go to our newly mounted uh, drive, 3TB. And of course, everything here is owned by root. Nothing user friendly here at all. So let's create ourselves, uh, we have to use uh, sudo, uh, a directory called Gary. That's where I want to have all of my stuff. Now, there it is, Gary. So when we expose this onto the network using uh, Samba, we're gonna expose, we're gonna share that Gary directory. The problem is there is no user called Gary at the moment. We are Pi, who am I? I am Pi. So really we wanna create a directory, called, uh, a user called Gary that can be associated with that. So the way you do that is you type in add user Gary. Now we'll go ahead and add Gary and then we need to type in a password and no, it's not password. And then you can actually go through and enter in some details here room number, work phone, this is all back from the old days of Unix where you'd, you know, if this was in an office, you wanted to be able to uh, put in people's details. We just put in nothing there, we just put in my name. And that's it, create. So now that we have a user called Gary, what we can actually do is change the uh, Gary uh, folder directory to be owned by Gary. So, so change own, that changes the owner. Who do you want it to do it to? To Gary and the way Raspbian, the way Raspberry Pi OS as it's now being renamed works is it's the uh, group and the person are all, there's always a unique group for every person. So it's Gary, Gary, and then Gary there is the name of the folder. So if we do that now and then do an LS, we can see now that Gary is owned by Gary. And now the last step to do is to configure Samba to share the Gary directory uh, on, on the network. So the way you do that is we want to edit a file called slash etc slash samba slash smb.conf and we go right down to the bottom of the file. Most of this is commented out as you can see the default options are generally pretty good and what we're going to do is add in a share. So you press O inside of Vi if you're using Vi to open, add in a new line and square brackets is how you define the name of the share. So there you go, I've defined a share now on the network called Gary. And what are we gonna say about it? Well, the first thing is where is it? So the path to Gary is slash 3TB Gary. Of course, that's the, what we're, we're doing. And now we can add in some other stuff, comment uh, Gary, just so that it appears on the, on the browser there in Windows browser. Uh, and we wanna also say, is it browsable? Uh, and that means that when you just open up the Raspberry but My Pi NAS, will it be listed as one of the shares? Yes, we do want that. Is it read only? No, I want to be able to copy files to it. And then this is probably redundant. I'm sure the um, the Samba experts will tell you, but I always put in, yes, writable, yes. I, I think that's redundant. And then the other thing is valid users. Who can get access to it? Well, Gary, we don't want just anybody connecting to this share. This is my network area on the network. Of course, you can change that. Uh, of course, because you can say here, guest okay equal to no. And you can play around with these so you can have multiple valid users. You can let guests read and write to it. You can configure all this kind of stuff here. Now, one other quick thing to change because we've created something, a share called Gary, and there's a user called Gary, well actually Samba is automatically sh uh, sharing directories for each user, their home directories. And of course, that means there will be a home directory for Gary. So you need to go up here to the section where you see, here it is, homes in square brackets. Okay, and basically we wanna just comment this out completely. So we can just go in here and we can just start commenting it out line by line to make sure that none of this stuff is actually uh, there. So that's all gone now. So the home share is no longer there, which means there's no longer a conflict between this one we've created down here, which is called Gary, and there would be one for Gary because he is now a user on the system. Now authentication with Samba can be a bit tricky, but basically because we've now sharing that with a user called Gary, we have to create that user inside of uh, Samba. Windows authentication is a whole big subject. There are lots of different ways to do this. This is just the quickest way I've found to do it. So what we wanna do is run the SMB password program, and we'll do minus A for add, and then you wanna say Gary. So it's now gonna add, a new user which is 
about authentication over the network for accessing the shares uh, as Gary and it will also ask me to enter in a password. So there we go, we type in a password. Now I use the same password just because it's easy to remember. That's up to you. And then finally what we need to do is restart the whole thing. So then we just do uh, sudo, super do, uh, restart, oh sorry, uh, smbd, uh, restart, notice the D there at the end. And that's it, so the SMB has now restarted. Okay, so here I've opened Windows Explorer. Now to access that uh, network attached storage that we've created, you go up here to the address bar and you do backslash backslash. And then we type in the name. What did we choose? It was uh, my pi zero nas. And then you go there and up comes the Gary share that we have just created. Now, if you get asked for a password, uh, then you just type in the username and password that we entered into that SM B password program if you remember and then of course now you can go here into Gary and then let's do something here let's do file new folder this is a folder okay and now if we go back here to our Raspberry Pi if we go into the Gary directory there we can go see this is a folder so we're actually now creating things on that external hard drive here on the uh, Raspberry Pi and of course, as I mentioned earlier, speed is going to be certainly a limiting factor here. We're using Wi-Fi, we're using a Raspberry Pi Zero, which has only got a single core processor on it. We're only using USB 2. So let's just see here, I've got a one gigabyte file, just over one gigabyte. Let's copy that now over onto the Raspberry Pi Zero, onto that external hard drive and see how long it takes. Windows will give us a rough speed here of what's going on with that one megabyte a second, uh, two megabytes a second. Obviously it's not very, very fast. So you're not going to be doing any real kind of, oh, it's even stalled a bit there. You're not gonna be doing any kind of work uh, loads on this, you know, trying to edit a Premiere Pro movie uh, on that external hard drive. However, if you're using it for backup, for archive, for just copying things, so you've got another place where you want your files, then uh, it's going to work but of course it's not going to be very very fast when copying over the data so as you can see it looks like the limiting factor is actually going to be the processing power of the raspberry pi if we look here you can see look at this the uh, smb d process is taking up well, 20 21 percent we've also got here a kernel uh, thing that's running at 25% we've got interrupts here running at 15% and when you look over here you can see 22% is user 50 59% is system and the system is basically not idle at all so this is really maxing out the uh, Raspberry Pi in terms of the user process that's the uh, Samba stuff not only that the writing to the USB network over Wi-Fi all that stuff that figures as system level stuff and the system is maxed out and that's one of the reasons why we're getting a lower, such a low throughput. Now let's try the same thing on a different Raspberry Pi. Okay, now here we are on a Raspberry Pi 3. I've done exactly the same steps to get to this point uh, that we did for the Raspberry Pi 0. And now let's copy over that same file. It's so the same hard drive. I took it out of the Raspberry Pi 0, put it into this Pi 3. Let's see what the copy speed is like now. Well, that's certainly a lot faster to even start with. Look for going down a bit now, three, two and a half, up to three, four. Okay, so I think it's gonna stay around more like four or five. So I would say four or five times faster. And now let's go over and run a top on here and see how that's doing with the CPU time to see where the bottleneck is. And so now we can see that it isn't the CPU that is the uh, bottleneck. As you can see here, it's 81%. Idle, of course, this is a quad-core processor. The SMBD process there is only taking up 10%. Uh, Obviously, you've got some uh, these processes here. We've got USB stuff going on. There's IRQ stuff going on. Uh, however, the bottleneck now isn't the processor. The bottleneck may either be the read-write speed through the USB port, could be Wi-Fi. But that just shows that a Raspberry Pi 3, in terms of processing power, can certainly cope with this. So not necessarily it's the right idea in terms of the network or the USB. 
Okay, and now here we are on a Jetson, NVIDIA Jetson uh, Xavier NX, and I've been through exactly the same steps, and they work exactly the same way because, of course, it's running uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. So let's copy over our one gigabyte file and see what kind of performance we're getting. Before I let go, this is using wired Ethernet now, and of course, uh, you've got uh, USB 3 talking to this hard drive. So let's see what we get now. Wow, well that's obviously way, way faster. Look at that, 113 uh, just straight across, not even struggling there at all in any way whatsoever. And that was just much, much quicker. So there you go. So obviously the USB, the networking and the CPU power do matter when it comes to copying over or to doing the file IO, but you can use any device, absolutely any device, uh, to turn a, net, a hard drive into network attached storage. It just depends on what performance you're gonna get from it. Okay, so that's it. So you should be able to try this on any kind of single board computer, whether it's an, an Orange Pi or a Odroid. It'll be interesting to see in the comments if you've been able to follow the same steps on a different board than the ones I've shown. Now, I've also got another section of video about how you can make the hard drive spin down and go to sleep, which is very important if you've made yourself network attached storage. You don't want the hard drive spinning day and night and burning themselves out. Now, I had that all recorded, but this video is already, I think, kind of getting a bit long. So I'm going to link that at the end to a separate video that you can just watch that just jumps straight into that topic without an introduction and all that. So if you want to watch about how you can get the hard drive to spin down and stay idle, please do follow that video. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kind of videos, well, why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.